Titanic. The very name has become synonymous with sinking. Tragedy. Death. But what really happened that night that is still as famous today as it was 110 years ago? Join me, T.H. Cooney, as we explore the various facts and theories in Titanic, a retrospective. The RMS Titanic was a 20th century steam-powered passenger cruise liner. It was the largest and grandest ship of its time, featuring the latest technologies, immeasurable luxury, incomparable design and superior speed. Titanic was intended to catapult White Star Line into the forefront of oceanic transport. She was built in Belfast, Northern Ireland, alongside two other identical ships, the RMS Olympic and Britannic. But it was not to be. As many people know, Titanic became legendary when it struck an iceberg and sank in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean during its maiden voyage from England to New York in 1912. White Star Line thus faced bankruptcy, and in 1947, commercial cruise liner manufacturer Cunard acquired all the rights. Today, Cunard remains the leading manufacturer of the most luxurious cruise ships. Sir Joseph Bruce Ismay, chairman and managing director of White Star Line, commissioned master shipbuilder Thomas Andrews to be the ship's architect. He designed Titanic to be an Olympic-class ocean liner, weighing 46,300 tons, measuring 882 feet long, 92 feet wide, and 175 feet tall. The ship consisted of 12 decks. From the keel were the lower, middle, and upper all-lop decks. Together, they housed the cargo holds, the mail room, boiler rooms, engines, electrical generators, plumbing works, machinery, and propeller drives. The boiler room's ventilation would extend through massive cavities within the ship's infrastructure, leading to the funnels on the boat deck. What made the ship allegedly unsinkable was the unique infrastructure design. Positioned across the hull were a series of 15 watertight bulkhead walls, each with a single watertight door. In the event of a major hull breach, the bulkheads could be sealed, isolating the flooding in that compartment. G-deck contained the squash and racket court and the food stores. On F-deck was the swimming pool, Turkish baths, hair salon, third-class dining saloons and galley, and the engineer's quarters. Located on E-deck was the men-at-arms office, steward's quarters, and some third-class cabins, all connected by the longest corridors on the ship, nicknamed Scotland Road. D-deck boasted a first-class dining saloon worthy of a royal banquet, headed by a reception room which also served as a first-class tea room. Titanic's piece de resistance was the Grand Staircase, a magnificent stair system proudly boasting a Louis XIV interior design, reaching from the boat deck all the way down to E-deck and topped with a beautiful glass dome. Above D-deck was Titanic's glorious white superstructure, comprising decks A, B and C, Sea Deck was also referred to as the Shelter Deck, containing officers' quarters and the library. 
B-Deck featured private promenade decks for first-class passengers, luxury dining in the restaurants, millionaire suites, and second-class smoking rooms. A-Deck was reserved exclusively for first-class passengers and contained first-class cabins, lounge, smoking room, reading and writing rooms, and the Palm Court restaurant. And finally, the boat deck, housing the bridge, the officers' quarters, the gymnasium, and the lifeboats. Curiously, Titanic only required three funnels for the number of boilers. The size of ships was, and still is to this day, highly competitive. So a fourth fake funnel was added to make the ship appear larger. This fourth funnel was in fact a kennel for the pets on board. At 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, the Titanic was sailing at full speed when it encountered an iceberg. The weather was unusually calm, albeit extremely cold, in the region of 10 degrees Celsius, with the water a lethal minus 2 degrees Celsius. The lack of bad weather made it difficult to see the iceberg. The sea was as smooth as glass, preventing any lapping at the edge of the iceberg and with no binoculars or a moon in the sky, the iceberg was practically invisible. While Captain Edward Smith slept, First Officer William McMaster Murdoch made every attempt to avoid the iceberg, ordering hard to starboard and slamming the propellers into reverse. The ship took a concerning amount of time to turn almost clearing the iceberg. Unfortunately, it impacted below the waterline and scraped across the starboard side for almost 300 feet, breaching five bulkhead compartments. As they passed the iceberg, Murdoch ordered to steer hard to port to swing the stern away and prevent any further damage. Major flooding had occurred and the watertight doors between the bulkheads were sealed as a precaution. The captain ordered all stop and led a team to assess the damage. Thomas Andrews determined the ship had suffered fatal damage and would sink in approximately one and a half hours. And so began the chaotic task of moving as many passengers as possible into the lifeboats and abandoning ship, with the women and children being evacuated first. Captain Smith ordered the Marconi wireless operators to send out distress signals to any ships in the area. The Morse code operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, were heroes that night. Without them, the SS Carpathia would not have come to Titanic's rescue. A few ships around the ice fields made for the Titanic, but navigating the ice fields severely delayed them. The Carpathia was the closest ship, but it didn't arrive for four hours. Titanic's designers were utterly convinced the ship could not sink, and so they decided lifeboats were not needed. The ship did not have enough lifeboats for even half the passengers on board. Worse still, the crew believed the lifeboats would buckle under the weight of too many passengers and loaded an absurdly low number into them, as little as 12 in boat number one. Outraged, Thomas Andrews confronted Second Officer Lightoller and convinced him to fill the boats with at least 60 people. The captain, aware of the grim fate awaiting him, his crew, and many passengers, did whatever they could to maintain order and save as many lives as possible, such as having the orchestra play lively music on deck to keep the passengers calm. By the time the first few boats were launched, the flooding had reached E-Deck.
As more and more lifeboats continued to leave the ship, the evacuation grew more and more panicked. Boat 13 had drifted beneath boat 15 due to the flow of water from the nearby pumps. With seconds to spare, the crew managed to cut the ropes away and push themselves clear. Time was running out. Water was spilling onto the boat deck. Riots ensued among passengers trying to get into the last two boats as they drifted away from the ship. Two hours and twenty minutes since Titanic struck the iceberg, the ship was beginning its final plunge beneath the water, descending more and more rapidly. As the bow descended, the stern was lifted into the air. The steep angle toppled the funnels, sent countless objects crashing forwards, and hundreds of passengers sliding helplessly into the water. A huge short circuit blew out the power generators and shut off all the lights throughout the ship at once. At approximately 45 degrees, Finally, the entire ship ripped apart between the third and fourth funnels, down to the keel, and the stern hurtled backwards to a level position. The survivors in the boats watched in horror as the cataclysm unfolded before them, a giant ship rising vertically into the sky and finally foundering beneath the sea. The 700 people in the boats were too distressed and scared to attempt a rescue of the people helplessly writhing in the icy water. For 20 minutes, the crew did nothing. Finally, two boats went looking for survivors, led by third officer Lowe and first class passenger Margaret Brown. She would earn the title the unsinkable Molly Brown for her courage. All 1500 passengers perished in the freezing water. A mere four were rescued, with one of them dying of hypothermia. As the dawn broke, the SS Carpathia arrived, rescued the survivors, and completed their voyage to New York. Starting up simulation. Decades of discussions about how the ship sank and what could have been done to prevent it gave birth to several famous theories. Since no photographic or video evidence of the event exists, the only source of evidence was witness accounts. These hypotheses changed repeatedly throughout history. Scene complete. Sir Bruce Ismay was determined to prove the ship's superior speed to the press and encouraged Captain Smith to sail at top speed and on a shorter route to New York. To avoid icebergs, most ships would steer south around charted ice fields, but Titanic sailed directly into them to shorten its voyage. For this, Bruce's May was blamed for the ship's demise, and he suffered greatly at the hands of the press, the media, and public outrage. Simulation running. Some believe Officer Murdoch may have sealed Titanic's fate by ordering full astern. Any ship loses turning efficiency when it slows down, which is why the ship took so long to turn. The flanking propellers were driven by the steam engines, but the central propeller was not. 
It was driven by an electrical engine and did not have a reverse function. Therefore, it remained stationary while the other two propellers were reversed. Furthermore, the central propeller was aligned with the rudder, and so, with no thrust flowing over the rudder, the ship's steering capacity was massively compromised. Scene rewinding. Scene updated. Ultimately, the ship might have turned faster and missed the iceberg altogether had the engines remained at full power. However, the higher speed may have caused it to strike the iceberg sooner, none of these theories can be confirmed. Simulation running. The first known witness account of the sinking was sketched and described by an artist named S.P. Skidmore, who survived the disaster. He and other witnesses claimed to see the bow sink beneath the water, the stern rise, the ship breaking beneath the waterline, followed by the bow being lifted out of the water again, to then lurch sideways, and finally both the bow and stern to list violently and sink almost simultaneously. Simulation failed. Scene rewinding. Most theorists disagreed with this so-called witness account due to the total disregard for the laws of physics. There is no possible way for a fully flooded and submerged bow to be lifted out of the water again once sunk, especially by an unflooded stern. The weight difference would be too great. Scene updated. The next sinking hypothesis is arguably the most popular. The flooding in the forward compartments spilled over into the next due to the bulkheads reaching no higher than E-deck. This was thought to be an engineering flaw. However, the engineers knew the ship could stay afloat with a maximum of four breached compartments. The bulkheads would only need to be this high assuming the system did its job. But five compartments were breached, so this flaw is irrelevant. The stern rose as the bow sank slowly at first, due to buoyancy. But once the bow had completely flooded, it began to rapidly submerge. Similar to placing a bottle on the surface of water, it would continue to float until it fills with enough water and then suddenly plunge. Perversely, the watertight bulkheads made the situation much worse. At first, the flooding spilled over each bulkhead wall sequentially but now that the ship had reached a 30 degree angle, the water could no longer reach the tops of the bulkheads and spill over. This phenomenon blocked off the flooding, creating what you might call a buoyancy axis. The bow was technically no longer sinking at this point, but rather falling under its own weight, slowly correcting itself towards a vertical position. The further the bow fell, the higher the stern rose. 45 degrees placed an estimated 32,000 tons of pressure on the hull, causing the entire ship to break. With the bow now completely submerged, it swung down, pulling the stern into a vertical position and separated to begin its descent to the ocean floor. The stern remained buoyant for approximately two minutes before flooding and finally sinking. Rewinding. Adjustments were made to the sinking theories throughout the 21st century. Scene updated. There is speculation that the ship listed to starboard and then to port as it submerged. Since the initial flooding was isolated in the forward compartments, much of the weight was concentrated on the starboard sections, tilting the ship to the right. Then, as the flooding intensified, the bow was pulled down and corrected. But water then rushed down Scotland Road on E-deck, 
triggering accelerated flooding on the port side, encouraging a list over to port by approximately 9 degrees. A greater study of physics suggested that the ship's maximum stress angle was in fact 23 degrees before breaking, and the conditions of the wreck proved that the break actually occurred between the second and third funnels, almost the very middle of the ship. The stern's sinking pattern was also updated, in that it did not float on the surface for a few minutes or even reach a vertical angle. The massive damage from the breakage caused major flooding, and the weight of the engines simply dragged the stern straight under, almost vertically, and lurching far over to port. The bow dove towards the ocean floor at 30 miles per hour on a steep angle, with the stern following shortly behind. The bow's aquadynamic shape enabled it to maintain this stable angle and direction. But such a huge object, diving through the water at speed, created a powerful hydraulic backdraft in its wake. The bow struck the ocean floor with enough force to critically destroy its infrastructure, and the wake subsequently smashed down upon it, flattening its nose and back. The stern did not fare as well. Major sections of the stern were still filled with air, causing it to descend slowly, until the increasing pressure caused these dry sections to rupture. The stern imploded, accelerating its descent. The stern whirled around and descended aft end first in a spiral pattern, losing many more pieces of hull and infrastructure. It came to rest in much the same pattern, a colossal 13,000 feet deep, and almost 2,000 feet from the bow. Like the sinking, there was no evidence to confirm the pattern of descent after the ship sank. In fact, it wasn't even known that the ship had broken apart during its demise, as witness accounts were not yet corroborated. But when the wreck was discovered in September of 1985, during an expedition led by Robert Ballard, it was found to great surprise to be in two pieces. This is what inspired the earliest theories about how the ship sank. With its location unknown and 20th century technology unable to reach it, the Titanic lay in its watery grave for 73 years until its discovery. It has been deteriorating ever since, growing rusticles, coral, and with numerous sea life having taken up residence. Archaeologists believe that the bacteria currently eating away at the ship will eradicate the entire wreck in as little as nine years from now. The wreck has been explored many times and artifacts taken and sold to museums. However, this is controversial, and considered by many to be grave robbing. Thus, the United States and the United Kingdom signed a treaty to protect the wreck and outlaw any further recovery of artifacts. After all, it is the gravesite of 1,500 people. The sinking of the Titanic remains the most famous ship disaster in history, a grand and glorious ship, rumoured to be unsinkable, not only sank but on its maiden voyage. The impact was felt the world over, the losses were devastating, the inquests were intense, and the news and media spread gossip and debate like wildfire. Careers were ended, and protocols were changed. Many of today's ship safety protocols were learned from the Titanic, such as greater responsibilities, more sensible decisions, better lookouts, and especially, more lifeboats. And of course, evolving technology making ships far more manoeuvrable. The memory of the Titanic tragedy will likely never fade, and is carried forward through history, books, and media. 
Countless graves, plaques, cenotaphs and memorials were laid in honour of those who were lost. Bless those who lost their lives. May they rest peacefully. And thank you most graciously to Captain Smith and the officers and crew for their unwavering courage and dedication. And bless the Titanic.